On the mound for New York this afternoon in the Cincinnati lineup he will face has Bip Roberts leading off at third base. Dave Martinez in center field. Barry Larkin at shortstop. The cleanup hitter is first baseman Hal Morris. Paul O'Neill in right field bats fifth. Batting sixth, the left fielder Reggie Sanders. Joe Oliver is the catcher hitting seventh. Bill Doran is the second baseman batting eighth and batting ninth, the pitcher Chris Hammond. Doc Gooden with a career record of 139 wins and 64 losses. But look at the disparity. He's 7-11 this year, 3.91, and those are his numbers this year. But look at the disparity between his night record at 98 and 35, his earned run average right around 2-6, and his day average. He gives up about a run a game more in the daytime and only 12 games over 500. Is there any logical explanation for that? I really don't know the answer to that other than the fact that players may see the ball better in the daytime. The defense behind Doc this afternoon, Kevin Bass in left field, Vince Coleman, the center fielder, Bobby Bonilla in right field, Chico Walker at third base, one of the real bright spots in a dull season for New York, Bill Pakota, the shortstop, Jeff Kent, newly acquired second baseman, and there he is. He came over in the David Cohn deal, a player to be named later. Uh, speculation has it that Ryan Thompson, a center fielder in, on the Syracuse ball club, the AAA affiliate of Toronto, will be that player. It'll be named next week. Eddie Murray at first base, Charlie O'Brien, a fine catcher behind the plate, and Doc Gooden on the mound. It is a beautiful day in New York, just a couple of puffy clouds overhead the game time temperature 81 degrees and very little wind to speak of the umpires working the ball game Mike Winters calling the balls and strikes the crew chief Bruce Fremming at first base Ed Montague at second and Phil Cuzzy calls the plays at third and Vip Roberts leads off he's a switch hitter batting 302 overall first pitch of the afternoon from Dwight Gooden slapped to Jeff Kent he started both games the doubleheader at second yesterday and he has an assist on the first pitch of today's game. Jeff going 0 for 4 in game one and then a double and a triple three RBIs in game two last night. How about that his first National League hit a triple. <laughs> one of the oddest one of the oddest of hits <laughs> particularly for the Mets they've only had 10 of them all year long. They have a chance to set the major league record for fewest triples in a season. That mark is 12. Dave Martinez at 254. He gets the start in center field today. A homer in 21 knocked in. One strike on Martinez. Walker in on the edge of the grass at third, respecting the speed of Dave. Good and just missed, low and away, one ball and one strike. You'll see throughout the day a number of batting averages versus lefties and righties for the Cincinnati Reds, and they have a number of hitters with quite a disparity, including Dave Martinez. The 2 1 pit is just outside. Yeah, Martinez, 275 average against right handers, 235 against left handers. But Paul O'Neill, about a 65 point difference, righties and lefties. Hal Morris, about an 80 point difference, right handers and left handers. So this is a team uh, where in the middle innings you can really left right this uh, lineup. And make Lou Pinella use his players early in the game to where if he gets in a late inning, extra inning game, a close game, he's used a lot of his players earlier. Barry Larkin, the batter. Gooden was all around the plate to Dave Martinez, but walked him. And it appears that Mike Winters is going to have a narrow strike zone. Larkin, as you saw, at an even 300 with 10 homers. He has knocked in 59. Martinez running on the first pitch. O'Brien's throw, a good one, but it gets away from Pakota. And Martinez has the stolen base. Charlie O'Brien has been outstanding at 
throwing out runners this season and that throw was right on the money. 21 of 47 caught by Charlie O'Brien. Watch Martinez sliding to the outside. Bill Pakota just drops the ball. That was no short hop. An excellent throw by O'Brien. And Pakota drops the ball and no error is given as a stolen base is given to Martinez. His 12th of the year. The runner in scoring position with one out and the breaking ball missed. It's 2 and 0 oh on Larkin. Barry has had the upper hand in his individual rivalry with Dwight Gooden. There's the disparity of which we were speaking for Larkin and against Gooden. Larkin is 11 for 26 in his career, a 423 average. I'll tell you what infuriates catchers is when middle infielders catch the ball or try to catch the ball in front of the bag and then bring the ball in the glove back to make the tag. One of the favorite expressions of catchers is stay on the bag. And mm -hmm. you could see there, had Pakota been on the bag, it would have been a much easier play. The reason they do that, they don't want the runner and the ball arriving at the same time. A little pop-up along the third baseline for Chico Walker. In foul ground, he makes the catch. Two down. Well, only Curtin Manwaring of the San Francisco Giants has done a better job of throwing out base dealers this season in the National League than Charlie O'Brien. And the batter is Hal Morris. The cleanup hitter checks in at 286. With five homers and he has knocked in 44. He's the best clutch hitter or has proven to be this year for Cincinnati a 341 average with runners in scoring position. That's sixth best in the National League. See in the early innings though you don't think about pitching around hitters and the reason is you really uh, amplify the uh, fact that the opposition can have big innings. You go right after guys in the early innings. Forget about first base being open for the most part. Mm -hmm. That one sailed high and away. It's 2-0 and oh on Morris. One of several Reds to spend time on the disabled list this year. He's just back in action after a stint on the DL with a hamstring problem. Well hit. Left center field toward the 396 mark. Coleman to the wall. Home run. A 2 0 pitch. Al Morris goes deep for the sixth time this year, and Cincinnati is off to a 2 0 lead. If you ever come out to batting practice and see major league hitters hit, not about a lot of velocity on the pitches, and when a pitcher runs a 2 0 or 3 1 count, 1021 to a hitter and that pitch is predictable well then major league hitters more often than not get the good part of the bat on the ball and that's what Morris did then he really crushed that ball. Mm -hmm. Lou Pinella told us earlier in the year he doesn't think Morris will ever be a big home run hitter but he'd like to see him hit more home runs he thinks he's capable of 15 or 20 per season that's just his sixth this year. And Lou has certainly been looking for more production this season from the man at the plate Paul O'Neill. Paul used the word terrible a week or so ago to describe his performance in 1992. We saw his numbers just a 253 average 11 homers 57 knocked in last year he hit 28 home runs and drove in 91. He was an all star last year. And he's been bothered by injuries including lately by a right wrist problem injured on July 29th x-rays a couple of days ago revealed that he has some instability in some of the smaller bones in his right hand. The 3 2 pin. It's the second walk of the inning. Gooden has not been sharp here in the top of the first. Injury to the right wrist huh. That reminds me of the uh, comment that Jimmy Key, who started for the Toronto Blue Jays last night in the 22-2 Milwaukee drubbing, 
He, he said about David Cohn, he said uh, Cohn was charting the game last night, of course, writing with his right hand. And he said that Coney's going to have to have his hand in ice so he could start today. <laughs> Tendinitis of the wrist charting that 22-run game chalked up by the Brewers. <laughs> oh, a big win for Milwaukee. Gooden kicks off O'Neal. Paul O'Neal guesses. Wrong. Ladies and gentlemen. 2-0 fastball to Hal Morris with Bip Roberts aboard. Puts the Reds on top by two. Where the Reds lead two to nothing after half an inning on a home run by Hal Morris off Dwight Gooden. Up in Toronto, David Cohn making his first start as a member of the Blue Jays this afternoon in game three of their series with the Milwaukee Brewers. And in the first inning, he struck out Paul Molitor for his first strikeout as a Blue Jay. David was on his way to leading the National League in strikeouts for the third consecutive year at the time of his trade to Toronto. Last guy to do that, Warren Spahn from 49 through 52. Chris Hammond on the mound this afternoon for the Cincinnati Reds. The lineup he will face for New York has Vince Coleman leading off in center field. Chico Walker is the third baseman. Jeff Kent at second base. The cleanup hitter, Eddie Murray at first base. Bobby Bonilla in right field. Kevin Bass is the left fielder. Bill Picotta, the shortstop, batting seventh. Batting eighth, the catcher, Charlie O'Brien. And Dwight Gooden bats ninth. Hammond working to Vince Coleman. He's working with a 2 nothing lead and with a fractured nose. You might have noticed on prior shots of Chris Hammond already today that he has a bit of a shiner under one of his eyes. Last Sunday in Montreal he was playing catch with his teammate Greg Swindell. He was distracted. He looked away. Didn't see a ball that Swindell had thrown to him. It hit him in the nose. He has a fractured nose. And a breaking ball that missed. Coleman ahead in the count. Two balls and a strike. Side, Bill Doran knocked it down and threw him out. You can hear boo birds in the background. I think Bobby Bonilla took the brunt of the boos here at Shea Stadium earlier in the year, but they have shifted to Vince Coleman. They still boo Bonilla, of course, with a big contract. He was expected to come in here and be the savior of this ball club but for the most part the Mets have gotten their money's worth out of Bonilla when you look at his numbers these are about uh, about the numbers you would expect mm -hmm. of Bonilla at this time of year He's been particularly good lately Chico Walker has two and his ball is off the glove of the left fielder Reggie Sanders Walker on his way in a second he'll stop there Sanders slipped down again as he retrieved the ball over in center field Looked like he was going to make a nice running catch. But it clanged off his glove and Walker is credited with a double. Well, you know the Greg Luganis theory, don't you? Don't dive unless you have to. <laughs> and that's what Reggie Sanders did. He didn't have to dive for this ball. He dives and almost catches it above his shoulder. I think you can catch that ball by keeping your feet. And the outfielder, speaking of keeping your feet, it's going to be difficult today as two rock concerts were held here last week last weekend actually Eric Clapton and Elton John two of our favorites mm -hmm. they were here together did they mess up the outfield Woo. they did indeed Jeff Kent looked at a strike you can see stripes sort of the gridiron effect even though they don't play football here anymore those stripes that you see are rows those were the aisles during the concerts the stage was right out there and straight away center field in front of the 410 mark the infield was protected but the outfield is loose in some spots and we saw some strange plays out there last night during the doubleheader Jeff Kent in the double dip last night was 0 for 4 with a couple of strikeouts in the first game welcome to New York but then things got dramatically better in the second when he went two for five and drove in three in the 12 to one win. 
field down to first. Bruce Fleming says no swing. 12 runs last night, Tim, in that second game from a lineup that in no way resembles what Al Harrison and Jeff Torborg had in mind for the Mets when this season started. That lineup in game two last night had five at bats in game one, and Jeff Kinn had four of them. <laughs> Looks like uh, one of those beat games you see in spring training at 10 in the morning. Split squad games. Which everybody loves to play in. They went up there hacking last night with the Mets. Pounded out 15 hits. And completing the sweep of the doubleheader. Ball in the dirt from Hammond. Two and two on Kent with one out Walker at second. Bottom of the first two nothing Cincinnati. In game two last night the Mets among others had Harold Boston, Dave Gallagher, Jeff Kent, Kevin Bass, Jeff McKnight, Chris Donalds, Bill Pakoda in the lineup. And lineups like that have become more dangerous at this time of year for contending teams. You have nothing to lose. You might as well air it out. You're not fighting for anything except uh, the overused word of pride. But Jeff you know, Torborg expected in late August to be a in contention and certainly with a lineup that included Bonilla and Murray yeah, and Hojo right. not the guys we mentioned. Mm -hmm. Off the end of the bat down to first to Hal Morris. Will beat Kent to the bag for the second out and on the play Chico Walker moved up to third. That's a very curious word uh, pride. It's almost We're always used in baseball in a negative effect. You never hear teams who are contending saying we're playing for pride. It's always the teams that are out of it. They're playing for pride. What they play for before. Jeff Torborg's got to be thinking that right now. <laughs> and a number of other things, oh, I'm boy. sure. Tough year for Jeff and, uh, and the Mets. Eddie Murray got off to a great start with the Mets. Numbers have dipped a bit lately. 253 now his average with 13 homers and 71 knocked in. Straight back to the backstop. I think an indication of how the season has gone for the Mets. They acquired Jeff Kent in a much criticized trade here in New York. He was basically a utility infielder for the Toronto Blue Jays backing up both Kelly Gruber and Roberto Alomar but here he is in his third game for the Mets batting third against a contending ball club. Yes yeah, playing time this year came primarily because of the injuries to Kelly Gruber. He played mostly at third base with the Blue Jays. Trying to work out of the problem here in the first. Working with a 2 nothing lead. We talked about uh, Hal Morris's proficiency with runners in scoring position. Well, the Mets uh, just the opposite. Their team batting average with runners in scoring position and two outs is 188, the lowest in the major leagues. The Elias Sports Bureau started keeping track of runners in scoring position in two outs in 1975. The lowest average by a National League team in that situation, 190 by the Padres in 1989. The Mets have a great shot at that. These numbers refer to this season. Not surprising that. Some of the worst teams in baseball this year are at the top of that list. Murray called out on the 3-2 pitch. No argument from Eddie. And the first strike out of the ball game for Hammond ends the inning. After one in New York, the Reds lead two to nothing. The Reds lead two to nothing after one inning on a first inning home run by Hal Morris. With Dave Martinez aboard. Reggie Sanders begins the second against Dwight Gooden. Sanders, Joe Oliver, and Bill Doran coming up. Reggie checked his swing, and Bruce Fremming concurs. One ball on Sanders. 
The 280 with 10 homers, and he has knocked in 29. Six of those home runs this month, but only eight RBIs to go along with those six home runs. A lot of solo shots. And he looked at a fastball for a strike, one and one. Those 10 homers, the most by a Reds rookie since Chris Sabo hit 11 in 1988. A big ball game up in Toronto today, and we'll be keeping you up to date with not only the score of the game, but how David Cohn is faring. Bobby Bonilla couldn't get to it. It bounced just on the field of play in foul ground in front of the stands. One and two the count on Sanders. And that slide is not unusual when outfielders go after balls like that. As a matter of fact, Bobby Bonilla was placed on the disabled list for the first time in his career by diving for a ball right in that locale. So Bobby sliding for it, and that's one of the reasons that outfielders do that to avoid an injury. Less chance of getting hurt sliding than diving. The one two pitch back him off the plate. Good and won his last start at San Francisco on the 24th five days ago that snapped a career high tying four game personal losing streak. So go Walker retires Sanders. Every pitch is not designed to get a hitter out. The next to the last pitch that drove Sanders back away from the plate was designed to keep him away from the plate, and that's when Gooden came back with the curveball. Now Joe Oliver, one of the hottest hitters in baseball at the moment. He's batched his career high with a seven-game hitting streak. He's hit safely in 14 of his last 16. And he was the National League Player of the Week for August 10th through the 16th when he had 11 runs batted in in six games. He fouled one straight back and it's 0-2. He's another of the Reds with quite the disparity. Facing left-handers as compared to right-handers. He took a fastball just outside. Here's what we were talking about with Reggie Sanders. Remember the one two pitch the one strike two balls pitch inside boom. And now with the count two and two Gooden went to the curveball. So that pitch before that designed to get him away from the plate and come back with the curve to get him out. Tony Perez the first base coach for the Reds. One of their all time great players. Three hundred seventy nine. Lifetime homers, more than 1,600 career runs batted in. He was the real leader of that big mm -hmm. red machine, and all the players will tell you that. You know, you hear about Rose and George Foster and Joe Morgan and Johnny Bench. There was the leader of the big red machine, and the, the greatest accolades come from his uh, former mm -hmm. teammates with Cincinnati. Breaking ball, struck him out. That's the second out of the inning and the first strikeout of the afternoon for Dwight Gooden. Not Gooden, uh, since he does not throw as hard as he used to, has had to rely on his curveball a lot more. That remarkable Cy Young Award year back in 1985, 24-4, 1.53 or earn run average. I have never seen a ballpark with electricity like that year for as long when a guy when a guy pitched with Doc Gooden. And I'm talking about Koufax, Gibson, Carlton, Drysdale. That is quite a statement, and you had a front row seat. Yeah. While those fellows that you mentioned were in their prime, played with and against some of the great pitchers at that time. And there's a base hit for Bill Doran through the left side. Second hit for Cincinnati. They have a two out base runner in the second. The Reds lead two to nothing. 45. Tim, do you think it's fair it's to say seven. that this is an important game for the Reds? They came to New York mm -hmm. with some momentum. They had closed the gap to three and a half from seven games in 
less than a week, but they lost two to the struggling Mets last night. Yeah, every day is a day of rationalizing for contenders uh, the last month of the season. The rationalization being that they lost a doubleheader and only lost a half a game because mm -hmm. Atlanta lost. You can look at it for, from a lot of uh, different ways, but here's a club that's struggling, the New York Mets, and you'd anticipate the Reds uh, putting up a battle. And they did in game one last night. They got blown out in game two, but uh, they did have a 3 1 lead mm -hmm. in game one, and the Mets came from behind. It was a very tough loss in game one mm -hmm. last night. Chris Hammond, the pitcher, is at the plate with a 1 and 1 count. And now 1 and 2. He's 6 for 36 this season. But the other way to look at it, probably the way Lou Pinella looked at it after the game last night, was we had a great chance to only be. Two games out of first yeah, place. Have right. swept the two games mm -hmm. instead of dropping both. Her ball pulled foul. Ball girls fielding flawlessly in this series. Sweet Lou. Thought it was. Uh, those comments that Pinella made before the game, actually with you last night, those are pretty honest comments mm -hmm. about uh, still learning as a manager. And Chris Hammond will try again to catch up to the fastball. Two strikeouts in the inning for Gooden, and after an inning and a half, it's 2 nothing Cincinnati. To be named later in the David Cohn trade, well, this is the player that was just named recently. <laughs> An aspiring catcher right there. Did you see that squat? My suggestion, give him a stethoscope instead. <laughs> <laughs> Catching takes its toll. Mets down two to nothing as they bat here in the second. Bobby Bonilla leads off. Facing Chris Hammond. Two and oh the count. Lou Pinella said yesterday when Hammond has his control, generally he is effective. That's off the glove of the third baseman Robertson in the foul territory. Bonilla on his way to second. He'll get there standing. It's a double for Bobby Bonilla. And for the second time in as many innings, the Mets have a runner at second with less than two outs. Unless it's a late inning game and a close game, most of your corner infielders, your first and third basemen, play toward the fatter part of the field because that's where most of the hits are. This ball, however, off the glove of the diving Roberts down in the left field corner, and Bonilla has a double, his 22nd of the year. Kevin Bass, the batter. Hitting 258 overall. He hit his first home run as a member of the New York Mets last night. He's hit only 204 for the Mets in 17 games with New York. Chopped to short. That will not move the runner along, but now Bonilla will try it. The out is made at first and at third. tell you what that is not a bad play the execution was what was bad about it with nobody out you try to get to third but Bonilla hesitates he's looking behind him who's behind him Barry Larkin's fielding the ball in front of him so the idea was right with Bobby but the execution was poor he waited too long to try to go to third nice play by Hal Morris a very strong throw to third base so two outs and the base is now empty after the double play a lot of people think that uh, the worst base running blunders are when guys get thrown out the worst base running blunders are when guys don't try to take the extra base Phil Pakoda in his first year with the Mets he came over from Kansas City along with Brett Saberhagen in the deal that sent Greg Jeffries Keith Miller and Keith McReynolds Kevin McReynolds to Kansas City. One and two the count on Pakota. Two nothing Reds. 
Morris in the second. That's in the hole, a tough play. Larkin, high throw. Morris came down with it, but not on the bag. And it's a two out infield hit for Bill Pakota, the third Mets hit of the ball game. What an athlete Barry Larkin is. A lot of general managers in baseball say that if they had to start a team, Barry Larkin would be their first pick. You see a play like that, and you agree with him. Charlie O'Brien looks at a strike. We mentioned that O'Brien is second in the league in throwing out base dealers behind only Kurt Manwaring of San Francisco, but he has not hit this year, nor really has he ever hit in his career. And Interesting watching the Mets lately that he has seen the bulk of the playing time behind the plate while young Todd Hundley hasn't played very much. You'd think the Mets would take advantage of their situation in the standings to get a better read on what Hundley might be able to do at the major league level. No question about it in my mind. I think one of the major mistakes the Mets have made this year uh, when you're having a bad year and you don't develop a young player in the process then that's a mistake. No knock on Charlie O'Brien, but Charlie O'Brien is a backup catcher, and nothing's wrong with Hundley. But the Mets, uh, they don't know more any more about Todd Hundley now than they did last year at this time. Todd Hundley, only 23 years old, I think is going to be a fine major league catcher, but his confidence is way down right now. Uh, his batting average is down. But when a young catcher comes into the league, you don't look at his batting average anyway. That's right. You look at his defense, number one, the way he handles the pitchers, number two, and then the hitter. There's no knock on Charlie O'Brien, but no, he is no. a backup catcher That's because right. he doesn't get many knocks, and that was just his 23rd hit of the year. He broke an 0 for 28 slump last night with a home run. He came out in a big way, home run in a double in game two. There's Charlie. But I think Todd Hundley is going to be a fine catcher one day, but uh, his confidence has been severely shaken, especially over the last month. White Gooden pulls a fair ball right over the bag at third. Dakota being waved around, and he will score. O'Brien to third. And the leading hitter among pitchers in the National League, Dwight Gooden, strikes again. That is his seventh RBI of 1992. And he came into the game hitting 288, 15 points better than the second best hitting pitcher in the league, Omar Oliveris of St. Louis. Doc's banking this ball down the third base line just over the bag, called properly by Phil Cuzzy, the third base umpire. Doc Gooden, not only the leading hitter among pitchers, he might very well be the leading hitter on the Mets before this season's over. Look at that. He's second right now to Chico Walker. Dave Magadan out for the year. Vince Coleman could catch Doc. <laughs> Sounds funny saying, but, you know, Doc takes so much pride in his hitting. He says that uh, if I were a hitter, I'd probably be playing at the double-A level right now. Ooh, he might be right. Yeah. He is an outstanding hitter, though. Swings the bat very well. The lack of hitting this year in Major League Baseball, I think he might be at a level higher than that. <laughs> yeah, right. He'd be somebody's DH in the other league. Vince Coleman looked at a ball outside. So four hits in the inning. And that double play looms large now. Five hits in all surrendered by Hammond. Three of them doubles. And he has fallen behind Vince Coleman, 2-0. and oh. Coleman was out on a ground ball to second his first time up. The Reds lead 2-1 to one in the bottom of the second. Line to hit. That will at least tie the game. O'Brien has scored. Gooden coming to the plate. The throw from Martinez. Safe. The throw was offline. Oliver fielded it and went lunging after Gooden but couldn't get him before Gooden went sliding across the plate. So a two-out uprising for the Mets. Three runs across here in the second, and they have taken a 3-2 to two lead. Joe Oliver did everything that he could. Watch him when he takes the throw. It's offline, 
and he catches it and dives back to try to get Gooden, but the spikes already touched the plate. Here it is again. Fine slide to the inside by Gooden as Martinez throw is offline. It's a single for Coleman. He took second on the throw. Six hits now for New York. Five of them here in the second. And four hits in a row with two outs. Gooden drove in the first run. Coleman the other two. Vince has now knocked in 18 runs this year. One and one the count on Chico Walker who doubled off the glove of Reggie Sanders in left field last inning. and one strike with two outs and Coleman at second. And this roller coaster ride continues for Chris Hammond. He started the season winning five of his first seven decisions, then lost six of his next seven before defeating the Phillies in his last outing on Monday. Three and one. Walker pulled it foul. The count is full. The way this is going, it seems unlikely that Hammond will be around at the end of the ball game. Chris is one of only eight pitchers in Major League history to have gone at least 40 starts into a career without pitching a complete game. Yeah, ex-teammate Scott Scudder holds the record. He had 61 starts without a complete game, now toiling for the Cleveland Indians. And that streak is still intact. A little pop-up could be a problem. Doran couldn't get it. Coleman in the score. It's four to two. That was a ball that could have been handled in shallow right, but wasn't by Bill Doran. Second baseman Jeff Kent. Bill did not get a good jump on the ball. Just out of reach. Of course, Bill Dorn has aged considerably since coming to Cincinnati, his hometown. Fine player for the Astros for so many years. Various leg ailments this year. He has slowed down a lot. Looked like he had trouble picking that ball up as uh -huh. he started after it. Common problem here at Shea and other major league parks because of all the white shirts during summertime. You rarely see balls uh, lost like that when the weather is cooler. Fewer white shirts. Jeff Kent, the batter. Bringing a bit of hot couture to, <laughs> to the whatever that means. Baseball field. <laughs> Someday I want you to compile all of the, your theories just like that. I remember you had the theory in the cold weather about why uh -huh. hitters don't like to get jammed. Well, that's a mechanical the the thing. Back. Yeah, mm -hmm. I think they, they are too quick with their hands. I think uh, hitters get jammed below the trademark inside. The, the warmer it is, the more sluggish their bats are. But when it's cold earlier in the season, their bats are quick and they break more bats off the end of the bat. You weird theories. That's without the distraction of all the white shirts. Mike Cubbage is the third base coach for the Mets. And through the signs while on the move. Jeff Kent the batter two and two the count two outs. Four runs in this inning on six hits. All the damage done with two outs. That pitch is off the mid of Joe Oliver. That should have been handled. Well, for a team in contention, the Reds have really played three lousy games to this point in this series against the Mets. Except for the first game last mm -hmm. night. I mean, they played well, but uh, often you lose games after that when you have a chance to win because you've lost the first game. Last night they had the two-run lead. The Mets came back. They won it on a 
They tied it on a pinch home run by Boston. They went ahead and won it four to three. And then the Reds blown out in game two and looked bad here today. And the long inning finally ends for Chris Hammond with a strikeout of Jeff Kemp. Four runs in the inning for the Mets and after two they lead four to two. The Mets lead four to two after two innings here at Shea Stadium and as promised we're keeping an eye on the proceedings in Toronto where David Cohn is making his Blue Jay debut this afternoon. This is action from the fourth inning and Paul Molitor with a base hit through the middle. It drove in Daryl Hamilton and the Brewers have a one nothing lead in that ball game in the fourth. Far cry however from their performance of last night when they scored 22 runs on 31 hits you know, on that in a moment. All the Brewers uh, hitters are tired today. <laughs> That's it right. takes a lot of energy to have 31 hits in one ball game 22 runs. Their arms are sore from swinging the legs tired from running around the bases An American League record for a nine inning game 31 hits a Milwaukee Brewer club record 22 runs. A lot of the individuals fatten their stats including Scott Fletcher and Daryl Hamilton who each drove in five runs. Robin Yao had just one hit but he's now only 13 away from 3,000 for his career. I think the Milwaukee Brewers have been the biggest surprise as a team in baseball this year. Mm -hmm. I think Phil Garner uh, of course he's in a tough league to get manager of the year because so many guys have done great jobs namely Tony La Russa of the athletics. Chopped over the mound. Pakoda with a tough play. Robert safe. He went in head first and just did beat the throw. And the Reds have the lead man on here in the third. Vip Roberts now one for two. When a guy like Roberts hitting from the left side chops a ball down and it takes three bounces to get to the shortstop, there's almost no way to get him. See him sliding by your picture at home right there. It's a great shot. There it is. Roberts a threat to run with Dave Martinez at the plate. Martinez himself a threat to run walked stole second and scored the first run of the ball game in the first. Roberts has stolen 36 he's only been thrown out 11 times. He's tied with. Ray Lankford of St. Louis for fourth in the National League in stolen bases. Marquise Grissom running away with the stolen base crown. The senior circuit with 65 steals. Sometimes the threat of the stolen base is more disconcerting to a pitcher than the stolen base itself. is running the pitch was low the throw got him close play at second but Roberts called out the play goes two to four one out of the base is now empty in the Reds third a lot of people talk about the strong arms of catchers but watch the footwork of Charlie O'Brien watch how quick the feet are on this release see how the shift of the feet the right leg behind the left one and the ball's in the air, much like a quarterback who throws to an outside receiver before he's looking. Thought he was safe on the first yep. replay. Yep, looked like he was in there. Mm -hmm. Lifted to center. Coleman the catch. Two away in the third. For those of you who might have been curious, the old American League record for hits in a nine inning game was 30. That happened way back in 1923. The Yankees wow. had 30 hits at Boston. Babe Ruth had five hits and Lou Gehrig had four in that game. Barry Larkin popped out to the third baseman. Walker in foul ground his first time up. The major league record for hits in a nine inning game is 36 by the Philadelphia Phillies. Nineteen 
The ball and a strike on Larkin. Was that during the period where you could ask for the ball either high or low? I don't know. Guys used to throw it underhand. That was baseball was a very strange game in those days. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Still is in many ways. Oh yes. <laughs> Including last night when you lost your scorecard. Correct. Out of the broadcast booth while working on the Mets local telecast, and it did not come back. No, it did. I lost my pin too. For insurance purposes, I said it was a cross pin. I was going to say, I noticed today, uh, in case uh, you're filing for this one as well, it's a very chintzy pen today. That is correct. I'm sure the hotel won't miss it. <laughs> Larkin in the right center, a base hit. That's going to roll all the way to the wall. And Larkin has third base on his mind. He's there standing with a two-out triple. Barry Larkin wears Doc Gooden out, and he takes this fastball actually on the inside part of the plate and drills it to right field. Triple number four for Barry Larkin, and there is Barry Larkin against Doc Gooden for his career. He is now 12 for 28, one for two today. Fourth triple for Larkin, as we mentioned. The Mets only have 10 collectively. Hal Morris at a home run his first time up. He represents the tying run at the plate. His two run homer to left center field on a 2 0 fastball in the first it was his sixth of the year and gave Cincinnati a 2 0 lead. But the Mets countered with four runs on six hits in their half of the second. They lead four to two as Morris sends one out of play. Morris in the hole 0 and 2. by O'Brien. The pitch almost hit Morris. It had to be difficult for Charlie to spot the ball and he prevented that from going to the backstop and saved the Mets a run. Oh, that is uh, so true. Fine play by O'Brien. He was blocked out of that pitch by the right leg of Hal Morris. That made the play that much tougher. Out of play and left again. You could tell in the previous pitch from the body language of Dwight Gooden that he thought that one was going to the backstop. He started in off the mound thinking he had uncorked a wild pitch. Now he loves to pitch to Charlie O'Brien. Charlie with a great set of hands, soft, cushiony hands, and he has caught 19 of 23 starts for Gooden this year. after catching 70% of Doc's innings last year. Another one-two pitch. That's well hit toward the gap in right center. And in for a hit. Bonilla able to snare it. The run scores, and it's 4-3. to three. So just as the Mets put something together with two outs in the bottom of the second, the Reds come up with a run with two outs here in the third. A triple by Larkin, and he is singled in by Hal Morris, who has knocked in all three Cincinnati runs. Fine hitting by Morris, but poor base running. He should try to be on second base, a one-run ball game. There are two outs, and you see Bonilla make a fine play. Now look at all he has to do before he can throw the ball to second base. Very tentative base running by Morris, but uh, very fine hitting. Perhaps the hamstring is still a bit sore. That's really the only reason yeah. you could think yeah, of why right. he wouldn't be at least trying to get the second. Mm -hmm. Paul O'Neill walked his first time up. Oh and two. 
lot of times if you run fast out of the box, you give yourself a chance to take the extra base. But look at Morris. He's watching the ball. Now by the time the ball drops, it's too late to go. Uh, that's a bad habit that a lot of hitters get in. They, they don't. It's not that they're uh, they're dogging it or loafing or doing anything like that. They get in the habit of watching the ball drop, mm -hmm. and then they decide, and it could be too late to decide whether to take the extra base. And I think that was the case then with Mars. I see so many major league base runners handicap the play. It appears in their own mind, rather than just run hard yeah, all the time right. and then be ready to take an advantage of a mistake by a fielder or simply a situation like the one we just saw where the ball is played but it's an awkward throw back into the infield they don't go all out and then when they try to turn it up it's too late Eddie Stanky uh, who was one of the finest baseball men that uh, I ever came in contact with used to have different ways of explaining it to you as teaching devices and in base running he used to say run through the bag mm -hmm. and not to the bag when you have that thinking you have a tendency to turn it on all the time. It's still one to nothing in favor of Milwaukee on the RBI single by Paul Molitor that scored Daryl Hamilton. And David Cohn now through four innings has allowed the one run on three hits while striking out three. In the day with a two and a half game lead over Baltimore. O'Neill to deep left. Bass on the run to the warning track and he made the running catch. Nice play by Kevin Bass to take an extra base hit away from Paul O'Neill. The Reds get one off Dwight Gooden and will return to Shea Stadium after this message and a word from your local station. The position of the middle infielders on a steal attempt. Look at Pakota right here. That was a steal of Martinez in the first. But watch Jeff Kent. See the position of him, where the glove is, and they end up getting the call with Bip Roberts in the third inning, and that was a big play because that would have been a run had Roberts stolen second. Getting the call that appeared to be a bad call that perhaps deprived the Reds of a run. It's a one-run game. The Mets batting with a 4-3 to three lead against Chris Hammond in the third. Eddie Murray was called out on strikes his first time up. That's a called strike. The level to count at one ball and one strike. Bobby Bonilla to follow and then Kevin Bass. Pulled down the line. Long throw for Roberts. High throw. Morris able to come down with it. One out. Fine played by Hal Morris on a high throw by Bip Roberts. Looks like Morris is trying to step over a puddle. <laughs> last night it would have been quite appropriate. Yes. Second game of last night's doubleheader delayed 38 minutes by rain. The Reds wished they could have started over again. Bobby Bonilla the batter. Double his first time up. He's in the hole here, 0 and 2. They're coming off the disabled list on August 19th, Bonilla tied a Mets club record by hitting homers in four consecutive games. It was the fifth time that, that had been accomplished in Mets team history. The dribbler kicked around by Hammond, and he couldn't make the play. Once he booted it the first time, you could see the anxiety starting to set in. Yep. And Bonilla is aboard on the first error of the ball game. There are some errors made by fielders that are vague. This is a blatant error. That's a big league error. You ought to get two on a ball like that. <laughs> Give him an error for the first 45 yeah. feet, another one for the right. second. Right. Some way of scoring where you get more than just one error. <laughs> Kevin Bass bounced into that 6 3 5 double play his first time up and called that one off his foot. Bass 
at the conclusion of today's game, Tim McCarver and I will select the Chevrolet Most Valuable Player of the Game. Chevrolet will donate $1,000 in the player's name to the Special Olympics. The Mets lead 4-3. They're batting in the third with one out and Bobby Bonilla aboard at first. The count is 0-1 on Kevin Babs. with the second base umpire at Montague. Last night on a disputed play, Glenn Braggs making a diving catch in left field. Ed Montague was the third base umpire. He made the call. Pinella argued vehemently. And Montague did not change the call. So some of those things carry over occasionally. You know, you're playing a day game after a night game. Uh, the umpires and the players, they didn't get a lot of sleep. But boy, I would think if I'm Ed Montague and he's out to argue about something that happened last night, I'd have to well, run him rather quickly. Now, I think it's a carryover that Montague uh, may have, uh, Lou may be more a little more sensitive mm -hmm. because of what happened last night, and Eddie uh, might feel the same way. Yes. Lou seemed to be gesturing out toward the outfield. And they're not chanting Lou. They are going. Canelo when he was a player with the New York Yankees, however. No. Enormously popular mm -hmm. player in New York. Whatever that was all about, play resumes. And Hammond throws to first to keep an eye on Bonilla. Bobby has stolen four bases. He's been thrown out three times trying to steal. and a foul ball past Bill Fakota in the on-deck circle. It's been a dangerous at bat for Kevin Bass. He fouls one off his foot and then almost uh, ducked into a fastball that was tailing in on the hands or sailing in on the hands. <laughs> Outside, Hammond throws all four of the basic pitches. The Fastball, curveball, slider, and changeup. He's somewhat like Charlie Liebrand of the Atlanta Braves. Both throw a circle change. They don't throw real hard. They rely on control for effectiveness. And as we mentioned, Lou Pinella said yesterday, ordinarily when Hammond has his control, he fares very well. Today, he hasn't walked the batter. But he's on the short end of a 4-3 score in the third. Yeah, there are other ways of being wild. Sometimes you can be wild in the center of the plate. Wild in the strike zone. Back to the mound. Great play by Hammond and the double play. That's the same guy who couldn't feel the ground ball a moment ago. <laughs> the double play ends the inning. Anything in the air, he's deadly. <laughs> After three, it's 4-2, four, 4-3, four, New York. Hey, that's good. It's time right now for the... Summary is sponsored by Budweiser. The Reds grabbed the lead in the top of the first on a two-run homer by Hal Morris. Then the Mets came up with four runs with two outs on six hits to take a four-to-two lead. Morris singled in Larkin who had tripled to cut the margin back to four-three. And that's where we stand as we go to the fourth. Dwight Gooden facing Reggie Sanders in one strike the count. Another good crowd here at Shea Stadium today. Check that lid. Sanders, Oliver, and Doran. Batters six, seven, and eight coming up for Cincinnati. Reggie bounced the third his first time up. It has not been smooth sailing for Dwight Gooden to this point. He's already allowed five hits, and he has walked two. Tipped into the middle of O'Brien. Two balls and two strikes on Sanders. And that pitch just.
just missed. Gooden has thrown 66 pitches already. He's facing his first hitter here in the fourth inning. Three and two on Sanders. Gooden has had more trouble against Cincinnati than he has had against any National League opponent. He had no problem there with Reggie Sanders. The strikeout is the first out of the inning. And the third strikeout of the ball game for Gooden. Coming up after baseball today on CBS, it's live third round coverage of the NEC World Series of Golf from the Firestone Country Club in Akron, Ohio. That's following today's game here on CBS. Craig Stadler with a one shot lead over Chip Beck through two rounds. Fred Couples lurking just three shots off the pace. Joe Oliver, a foul ball for strike one. He struck out swinging his first time up. Mentioned Oliver's hot streak. He was the National League Player of the Week for the 10th through the 16th. And what a day he had on August 12th. His wife Kim gave birth to their second child, a daughter named Kara. And that night, Joe went to the park and hit a three run homer in the Reds' 3 2 win over Los Angeles at Riverfront. Pretty proud day in his life. He'll mm -hmm. never forget that one. The game in which uh, the Reds won three to two. Joe says he's as confident as he has ever been at the plate right now. The ball looks like a basketball. He's made some changes. You see that front foot pointing back toward his back foot. He's trying to go more to the opposite field at the urging of manager Lou Pinella. It's pointing back because it keeps him back. When you see a, a hitter do that, it prevents him from lunging. It's kind of tough to lunge with your foot in that position. But that's why uh, why hitters do that. One of the key things in hitting is to stay back and to have quick hands. Those are two of the biggest keys in hitting effectively. The 2-2 pitch. Joe said for a while he didn't realize that there was a right field in baseball. Most of his career, in fact, had left field only on his mind. really had to do yeoman work for the Reds this year with Jeff Reed on the disabled list since April 26th he had arthroscopic surgery on his right elbow Oliver strikes out he always had to start 108 of the Reds first 128 games including today only two catchers have caught more games Darren Dalton of the Phillies Tom Pagnazzi of the Cardinals and there's that unusual style only because it looks unusual if it works it's not unusual mm -hmm. and it's been working a lot for Joe lately not today he struck out twice I would think that stance might become fashionable we mentioned earlier in the year, Mark McGuire. Yeah, had right. the fan yell at him at the end of last season. Mm -hmm. They go back to your pigeon toe. Pigeon toe, right? Certainly has worked for him. Bill Doran, the batter, he singled his first time up. Base is empty with two outs in the Cincinnati fourth. The Reds trail by a run. During the next half inning, will be joined by Al Harrison, the executive vice president and general manager of the New York Mets. and one now on Doran. And he walks. That's the third walk thrown by Gooden, but the first since he walked two in the first inning. And you might think, uh, well, that's an insignificant thing, but what that does, it clears the pitcher, Chris Hammond, so Bip Roberts can lead off the fifth inning. That's very, very important over the course of a game, how a pitcher works a lineup. Sandy Koufax used to say the eighth place hitter is hitting there for a reason. That's why you go get him. Chris Hammond, the pitcher, struck out, swinging his first time up. The 
corner. Hammond in the hole, no balls and two strikes. Mention Gooden has had more difficulty against Cincinnati than any other team. His career ERA against the Reds, 3.31. That's pretty good when that's the toughest time yeah. you've had against anybody, 3.31. The Reds have hit 276 against White in his career against them. No other team has even hit 250 against Gooden. Hammond strikes out, and he struck out the side. It presents Major League Baseball. Today's game is brought to you by Oldsmobile, the power of intelligent engineering. Pinnacle by score, serious cards for a serious game. And by Coast, deodorant soap. With Tim McCarver and Mets general manager Al Harrison, happy to have you with us as we head to the fifth inning, talking with Al about a number of subjects, most notably the trade of David Cohn on Thursday to the Toronto Blue Jays in exchange for Jeff Kent and a minor league player to be named later. And Al, we talked about the, that the other player cannot be named, and you explained the reasons why. The batter, as we go to the fifth inning, is Bit Roberts at the top of the order. Does this signal a bit of a rebuilding process, which has been a popular word here in New York the last couple of days? Well, I know I've been asked that question a number of times. Uh, I think you have to look at our roster, and when you look at our roster, you see that we have 25 players or eight players on our 25-man roster who will make $25 million next year. And I would suggest to you that rebuilding does not apply to an organization that's that committed to that many people. Uh, I have preferred to use the word reshape. I don't think you'll go through a year in Major League Baseball the way the rules are now and free agency rules and so forth where there's not some transition, and I think that would be true for us this year. Nice play by the newly acquired Jeff Kent to throw out Vip Roberts for the first out of the fifth. Roberts now one for three. Expansion this year is certainly going to be different than in years past. Back in 1976, the first year of, sprint, of free agency, 1962, it was a much more simple process. Uh, why, if that's true, why is this year different? And would it make sense to leave a player with a big salary off the, the original 15-man expansion roster, a guy like Bobby Bonilla? Well, uh, obviously, whether they are veteran players or young players who have played some in the major leagues or are in AAA, AA, or even A-ball, you're going to expose some very good talent regardless of what organization that you're talking about. Uh, I really do feel that it's very hard to make plans. We had a nice play by uh, Jeff Kent. <laughs> I knew you <laughs> wouldn't let throw that in. <laughs> That's right. We knew you wouldn't let that one go by. <laughs> I'm sorry, but I couldn't pass the opportunity, guys. You took your first step toward play-by-play, -play, Al, with that comment. <laughs> Al, why don't you give us a little commentary about the replay? Nice backhand play by that second base. <laughs> All right, Mark. <laughs> anyway, um, uh, it, it's very difficult to make your plans for next year. Uh, pre-November 17 because you just don't know who you're going to have on your own ball club, let alone who you're going to have uh, with other clubs. And uh, there will be players who will be exposed, I'm sure, uh, from, from a variety of clubs uh, who are people who have a lot of service and perhaps make a lot of money. But it is a risk. And uh, you put them out there, they may be taken. Uh, perhaps they will not be, but you're certainly taking a risk. Barry Larkin, the batter, we're visiting with Al Harrison, the general manager of the Mets. Two down at the top of the fifth. The Mets lead 4-3 to three as New York looks for its sixth straight win. Al, they're going so quickly. Could you indulge us for another half an inning? Surely. Gooden works a one, two, three, fifth. Halfway through the ball game, four, three, New York. <laughs> Sean McDonough with Al Harrison, Tim McCarver, back here at Shea Stadium, where the Mets lead four to three. And as you can see, Milwaukee has now opened up a three to nothing lead over Toronto. David Cohn has given up four hits and has walked four in his Toronto debut. And Chris Bazio is shutting out the Blue Jays to that point. Here it's 4-3 in favor of the Mets, and they have the top of the order coming up against Chris Hammond, who has not allowed a hit since the Mets had six hits in the second. See that line on David Cohn, and I guess you have to wonder, what if David Cohn goes to Toronto and ends up 0-6? Would that hurt his chances for free agency? Would that lower the number, possibly? Well, you, I, it's hard for me to answer that, Tim. Everybody obviously has their own evaluations, but I wouldn't think so. David's track record is so outstanding uh, for so long and 
assuming he's healthy, uh, I, I wouldn't think the, whether he won or lost this last six or seven games would materially change his value. So his risk in the month of September is minimal. Other than injury, I would say uh -huh. yes. Holman takes ball four outside. Now, what's the right word to describe your reaction to what has happened with the Mets team this year? Is it shock, surprise, frustration? What's what is one or two of the words that come quickly to mind? Well, you hit three pretty good ones, Sean. <laughs> uh, certainly, I never felt we'd be 12, 13, 14 games out at this point in the season. When, as, as I looked at our club last spring, um, we really never got off the dime uh, after opening day, and and we went into August. Uh, not really having played all that well and still being only four or five games back. Uh, I really felt sooner or later we had to hit our stride, particularly offensively, because we didn't hit all year long. Uh, it never really did happen. And then, of course, instead of having one or two injuries at a time, as we had had earlier in the year with Vince Coleman and John Franco and Brett Saberhagen, we started getting them in threes and fours and, and fives, and that was just too much, and uh, we really went under during a road trip to Pittsburgh and Chicago. Chico Walker is the batter, 0 and 1 the count. That was the first walk thrown by Hammond. The walk to Coleman to start the fifth inning. Walker's at a perfect day, two for two with a double and an RBI single. Let's try to build on a four to three lead in the fifth. Now yesterday, Jeff. Torborg told us the throw goes down the right field line. On his way to third is Coleman. And he'll stop there as the throw comes into the plate. Oliver threw down to first and airmailed Hal Morris. It had to be retrieved along the line by Paul O'Neill. It looked like uh, Joe Oliver got that ring finger involved. And a lot of times when that happens, a catcher will choke a ball that he's throwing. It's almost like a palm ball. And that ball just squirted out of Oliver's hand. And Vince Coleman will stop at third base. And I would imagine Luke Pinella will bring the infield in. Sixth error by Oliver this season. Second error by Cincinnati in the game. And indeed, the infield is in for the count one and one on Walker and now one and two. We'll hold back on the question for a moment that I was about to pose to Al. Hammond will get a new ball with Walker at the plate and Jeff Kent on deck. In the air along the left field line, the wind helping to keep it in fair territory and right on the line, the catch is made. Coleman will score with ease. And it's 5-3 New York. Second RBI of the game for Chico Walker. He continues to have a perfect day. He's now driven in 24 runs this season. And I'll ask the question now. Jeff Torborg told us yesterday how he felt that based on the record and that the Mets have been disappointing, he could not say that he or his coaches had done a good job. He felt that Based on the record, you'd have to say they've not done a good job. What would be your evaluation of Jeff and his coaching staff this year, and how much, if any, of the blame should they assume? Uh, I certainly can't be critical of Jeff and his coaching staff uh, for our complete failure to hit. We just haven't hit all year long, and uh, we've had plenty of established hitters on this club who haven't come close to their, to their normal seasons. Uh, I don't want to single anybody out because I don't want to be particularly critical of any one individual, but to just cite one example, Howard Johnson's been a terrific hitter for us. Uh, and has gone from 38 home runs to seven. You just don't anticipate that sort of thing. And uh, injuries are a big factor as far as Howard is concerned in, in terms of that drop off. Same thing with Brett Saberhagen. Here's an outstanding pitcher who we've never been able to get out on the mound all year long. And we really felt he was one of the keys to our season in our club. Um, I sort of feel the day Brett went down in Los Angeles uh, early in the season, I believe in May. May 15th. Uh, May 15th. And I was called out of the stands to come to the clubhouse uh, to hear that he had a sore finger. Uh, I never realized at the time it was as serious as it was, but that really became the key to a lot of things that happened to us later uh, because we really had counted on Brett to be uh, one of our big aces on the staff. What about the prospects of signing Brett Saberhagen? Well, I'd like to have Brett Saberhagen for a long time, but uh, 
it's a little premature to decide that now. I think the first thing we have to do is get him back in the mound and pitching. And, and uh, I'm sure that's what he wants to do, too, and, and, and get him back in the mold of being one of the top pitchers in baseball. After that, I'd love to sign him and keep him here. Jeff Kemmer, with a fly ball to right, handled by Paul O'Neill. For those of you who did not see the papers this morning, particularly those of you who live outside of the New York area, Brett Saberhagen, after last night's game, commented that his situation next season will be similar to that of David Cohn this season, and that if he thought the Mets were going into a rebuilding situation, he did not want to be around to be a part of that. He might exercise his right to demand a trade. How much of a possibility do you think that is? First of all, I, I think people like uh, Brad and John Franco are good friends of David Cohn, and they certainly were disappointed. I'm sure that he uh, was going to be with another ball club, and that's certainly understandable and a very human reaction. I, I think the second part of it is that you rarely see the kind of thing that was described in the newspaper today, somebody demanding a trade, because what you do when you do that is forfeit your right to be a free agent for the next five years. And I really don't think that, that Brett or anybody else uh, on reflection would want to do that. Al, we appreciate you joining us. Thanks, Thanks very Al. much. Okay, Tim. Thank you. We'll return to Shea Stadium after this message and a word from your local station. Gooden working with a two-run lead now as we go to the sixth. He'll face the middle third of the Cincinnati order in the sixth, having thrown 91 pitches. He's retired four in a row. He hasn't allowed a hit since the third. He is yet to retire Hal Morris this afternoon. Morris has driven in all three Cincinnati runs with a two run homer in the first and an RBI single in the third. On the run and left Bass to the warning track it's over his head. He played it nicely on a hop off the wall. The throw is not in time. I think Morris is still bothered by the hamstring watching him run again that time. It's a double and he needs now only a triple for the cycle this afternoon. He's certainly not bothered by Doc Good. He is three for three. He is single, doubled, and homered. And uh, you mentioned earlier that Lou Pinella trying to get more punch out of the bat of Hal Morris. And when left-handed hitters can hit the ball effectively the other way, well, then that is a sign of power. I remember we were standing around the batting cage with Lou that afternoon trying to get and watching Lou trying to get Morris to turn the hips and use the lower part of his body. Mm -hmm. That was at Riverfront in Cincinnati about two months ago. He's done it today I'll tell you. Indeed he has Paul O'Neill representing the tying run at the plate. One strike on O'Neill. Morris at second with nobody out in the sixth inning. That's the sixth hit for the Reds. One and one on O'Neill. You would expect that Paul rarely has to pay for a meal when he comes to New York. I was thinking the same house. thing. Molly O'Neill, the older, oldest sister. That's the short. Dakota will go to first and on the play. Morris moves to third. Molly O'Neill is the oldest child of six. There are five boys and one girl one lady and the O'Neill clan and she is a food writer for the New York Times and she is coming up she's branching out however and tomorrow she is coming out with an article I think in the leisure section it could be in the magazine about boxing and the name of the article is Molly Ali <laughs> her name is Molly O'Neill gotta love it don't you Molly Ali got to love her job too. Paul told oh, before the game yeah. she's heading to Montana to mm -hmm. work on a story tomorrow. A couple of weeks ago she had a story about calamari which is squid uh, in Italian and I'll tell you if you can write an article an appetizing article about squid you're doing your job. Now you told me you like squid. I love squid mm -hmm. but I was saying that for the masses. Most yes. people don't like squid. I'm with the masses. I love squid. <laughs> Why don't you like squid. I just don't. Too chewy. Yeah it is very chewy. <laughs> but apparently not too chewy for you. No I love it. She must be talented to write an interesting article about squid. <laughs> One and one the count on Sanders. 
One out, a runner at third. In the sixth, 5 3, New York. Fouled off the catcher, O'Brien. will be followed by Joe Oliver. One two pitch. Now back in our direction. Gooden says he is physically sound. He did spend some time on the disabled list. He's placed with the DL back on July 18th. With inflammation of his right shoulder. He's making his fifth start since being activated from the DL. Sanders is making him work. Nice play below us as the ball came off the screen. Gooden has been giving St Sanders a steady diet of fastballs. And if you're blowing the ball by a particular hitter, you don't want to speed up the bat by throwing off speed pitches. Got him. And Gooden didn't speed up the bat. Matter of fact, the bat didn't even budge. Right there. Six strikeouts now for Gooden. He has fanned Sanders twice, and Joe Oliver has also struck out twice this afternoon. Joe's 0 for 2. Gooden has really feasted on the bottom part of the order. All six strikeouts have come from the number six spot on the Reds batting order on down. Sanders, the number six hitter, is with twice. Oliver twice, and the pitcher Hammond twice. are at Philadelphia again tonight. Atlanta suddenly lost four in a row. They lost to the Phillies seven to three last night as Terry Mulholland pitched his National League leading ninth complete game. A strike in a count of two and two. Tonight at Philadelphia it's Charlie Lebrand against Kurt Schilling. Leadoff double from Morris. They're trying to avoid leaving him at third. Oliver with a high fly to deep right center. Coleman on the run to the warning track. It's off the track and over the wall. A double and a run for Cincinnati. Morris scores from third and Oliver continues hot. Gooden trying to punch him out for the third time in as many at bats. Second baseman. But Oliver wouldn't let him do it. And Sean, your remark about. Uh, Joe Oliver earlier about not knowing where right field was formerly in his career comes back to haunt Doc Gooden as Oliver just overpowers the ball the other way and it bounces over the fence for a ground rule double. They're going to pitch around Bill Doran the number eight hitter with first base open and the pitcher Hammond do which would make you think that they would bat for Hammond. The thing against doing this is you're putting the potential go ahead run on base. The Mets with 23 intentional walks this year. That is not only the most in the majors. The average in the National League of the other 11 clubs a little over seven. Mm. Jeff Torborg has been criticized sometimes for walking number eight batters. A particular case was in Atlanta about a month ago when the Mets were last there. 
That and for the pitch Jeff Torborg walked Raphael Belliard, a guy who has no power at all, who has a tough time driving in runs, and opted to pitch to Steve Avery, who in some estimations are, is he's a better hitter than mm -hmm. Belliard. Nothing against Rafi, but Belliard is a defensive shortstop. Everybody knows that, and Avery is an excellent hitter. So that's the 23rd intentional walk of the year by the Mets. To a number eight hitter. Yeah, to a number eight hitter, right. Jeff Branson batting for the pitcher Hammond, and you saw Scott Ruskin warming up. He'll be the new pitcher when we go to the bottom of the sixth. Branson hitting 292 overall. He's been an excellent pinch hitter. 11 for 26 off the bench. But he's up with the tying run at second. The go ahead run at first. One run in here in the sixth for Cincinnati. It's 5 4. New York and Jeff Innes is throwing in the Mets bullpen. Branson with the best pinch hit average in the National League among those who have pinch hit 15 times. Oliver, the runner at second, and Doran at first. With that double, Oliver extended the longest hitting streak of his career to eight games. Chop to second. Kent throws him out. The Reds get one and strand two. After five and a half, the Mets still lead 5-4. The score has narrowed at Toronto. The Brewers led three to nothing, but finally the Blue Jays got to Chris Bazio in the bottom of the sixth. Joe Carter up with a man aboard, and he rocketed his 28th home run of the year to cut the lead to three to two. Carter now tied with Cecil Fielder for third in the American League with those 28 home runs. Here it's 5-4 in favor of New York as the Mets get ready to come up in the sixth against reliever. Scott Ruskin who brings a record of four and one into this action. He's appeared now in 45 games. And he's on for Chris Hammond who worked the first five. Tonight at 8 Eastern CBS Sports presents its final NFL preseason football game. As the Minnesota Vikings undefeated in the preseason under new coach Dennis Green travel to our nation's capital to play the defending Super Bowl champion Washington Redskins in the summer's final tune-up. That's tonight at 8 here on CBS. And it was great before the game down in the Cincinnati clubhouse to see our friend Bill Parcells here to visit his pal Lou Pinella and watch the ball game. And he looked terrific. He the certainly did. Heart surgery. Bobby Bonilla the batter. And he is doubled and reached on an error by Chris Hammond. Only be followed by Kevin Bass and Bill Pakota. Hammond worked five innings. He allowed five runs, four earned. And on seven hits, he walked one and struck out three. Chop foul down to Mike Cubbage. Making a friend. And a nice catch by that young fan in the blue hat. Scott Ruskin is 29 years old from Jacksonville, Florida. Plus, a good breaking ball, and that curveball was lifted to right into the glove of Paul O'Neill. One down in the sixth. Ruskin, a converted outfielder. He was an All-American at the University of Florida as an outfielder in his junior and senior years. Seems like the Pirates uh, make a habit of that. Tim Wakefield, a converted first baseman, and he has really helped the Pirates' cause. A knuckleballer, signed in 1988. He has helped keep Pittsburgh atop the National League East. He certainly has. Ruskin started out in the Pirates organization and his first three years in professional baseball were as an outfielder, 86, 87, and 88. He advanced as far as double-A ball as an outfielder. He was converted to pitching in 1989. Jim Leland remarked in spring training a couple of years ago, when you see a left-hander who can throw hard and has a good curveball, and he's mm -hmm. not hitting particularly well in the minors. You're making the pitch. Yep. The 
one to bass. He was fouled off his foot. Now left-handed pitchers can do more with less. They can get hitters out with less, less stuff than a right-hander. There aren't too many uh, left-handed pitchers who can throw a ball straight, and right-handers have to try to throw a ball with movement. Right-hander, for, for whatever reason, uh, throws a baseball a lot truer than a left-hander. Mm -hmm. That's why there are a lot more left-handed pitches, pitchers in baseball, and I would imagine that for that reason, that would be why there are a lot of right-handed quarterbacks in football. That left-handers have that unusual spin on the ball, and it makes it more difficult to catch. Just a thought. Mm. Bass called out on strikes. For those of you who were with us earlier, you'll understand what this question means. Uh, but white shirts probably have nothing to do with it. <laughs> no, because football is played in the fall. Oh. And white shirts aren't worn. Mm -hmm. That's why more outside receivers catch balls. That's why the hands are better. Totally incompetent answer. Right well, there. I would say that then the, the receivers for Tampa Bay and Miami and maybe Phoenix shouldn't be quite as accomplished. I knew you would get to that. Bill Picotta, the batter. Two outs on the base is empty. You're going for the jugular, aren't you? No, I'm going to back <laughs> off right now. Thank you. <laughs> I'm waiting for this inning to be over. <laughs> Picotta, a well-hit ball to center, but Martinez is there. One, two, three, go the Mets in the sixth. We head to the seventh with New York leading by a run. Baseball today's game is brought to you by Toyota reminding you to buckle up do it for those who love you Rollades Rollade spells 100% relief and by STP the makers of Preston advanced formula antifreeze 5-4 is the Met lead as we go to the seventh and there's a new pitcher on the mound for New York He is Jeff Innes Jeff Innes a middle reliever matter of fact he has only one lifetime save for the Mets He's a sinker ball pitcher, and his breaking ball is very unusual in that it stays on the same plane or it goes up. There used to be a pitcher in the major leagues, a short reliever who was a tall guy, by the way. His name was Ted Abernathy. Mm -hmm. High pockets, we used to call him. And uh, he threw a similar type breaking ball that Ennis does. Dick Schofield also comes into the ball game, so Schofield will bat in the spot in the order previously occupied by Gooden. And Ennis would bat at Dakota's number seven spot. He'd be the last man up next inning. Top of the order in Vip Roberts. As an infield hit in three trips, he has twice bounced to second. Walker in on the grass at third. Ennis sinks one in at the knees, one and one. Dwight Gooden worked six innings. He allowed four runs. On seven hits, he walked three and struck out six. The pitches were starting to pile up for good, and he had thrown 114. And drifts low and away. Two and one. Roberts, then Dave Martinez and Barry Larkin. We talked with Lou Pinella yesterday about the Reds and how they've been able to stay on the heels of the Braves despite all the injuries and the Braves hot play and he said I don't know where we'd be without Biff Roberts traded for Randy Myers during the offseason Roberts strikes out Let's take you around the horn during the seventh inning in the National League. Earlier this week, Deion Sanders announced that he will remain with the Braves for the remainder of the season and miss at least the first six games of the Atlanta Falcons season, perhaps even eight games if the Braves go on to postseason play, although that commitment was not put in writing as far as we understand. Deion has simply announced that he will stay for the remainder of the year. Dave Martinez is the batter one ball to count he's over two with a walk and a run scored back in the first two and all the count.
continuing our trip around the horn in the National League. The nephew of Dwight Gooden, Gary Sheffield. And you mentioned football. He and Doc Gooden uh, went to a football game, an exhibition game, eight days ago in San Diego, the Chargers and the 49ers. It's chopped to second, and Jeff Kent. And before, and before the game, the Chargers and the 49ers, Gary Sheffield cooked dinner for Doc Gooden. And here's what Doc had to say about Gary Don't Sheffield's Doc. cooking. He was up there by himself now. He had his fiance living with him. So uh, he said, I said, you gonna be all right by yourself? He said, sure, you know, you can cook and do all this. So Friday when was in town, we had off day. So he was preparing macaroni and you know, chicken, string beans and rice. Chicken wasn't good at all. I didn't think no man could screw up chicken in the macaroni. I mean, he's got to go back to the kitchen. So uh, he's got himself together playing ball. So hopefully this winter he can uh, better himself in the kitchen. <laughs> Pretty harsh. He may win the triple crown, but he's no Julia Child. I mean, the one thing about Gooden, I mean, his eating habits are legendary. I mean, this guy can put away some groceries. And Doc told me, he said, if I turn down a meal, if I leave early, you know it was bad. He said it was the worst meal he had ever had cooked by his man. I would think uh, with the salary range of both Sheffield and Gooden, they could hire a chef for the night or have a catered meal. Mm -hmm. Go to a nice restaurant. Nice that Gary was willing to make the effort for his uncle. An effort apparently not really appreciated. Two and one the count on Barry Larkin. He was one for three. He tripled and scored in the third. That's like the Rita Rudner line. She said her mother was such a bad cook. She used to go into restaurants and he said home cooking. She left. <laughs> Rogan bat fly ball shallow right center Bonilla makes the catch Innis works a one two three inning seventh inning stretch at Shea Stadium the Mets still leading by a run. Hey everybody it's time right now. Sean McDonough with Tim McCarver our producer Rick Lasavita our director Joe Assetti. As always we appreciate the assistance of Steve Hurt and Buzz Hannon here in the booth. And all of the men and women. We're combined to bring you Major League Baseball on CBS on this beautiful Saturday afternoon. Charlie O'Brien pulls one down the left field line. A long run, and Sanders couldn't get there as it's into the stands. Brian, then Schofield, and the top of the order, Coleman, do up against Scott Ruskin here in the seventh. Ruskin came on last inning and worked a 1 2 3 6. 5 4, the Mets on top. The hits even at seven apiece. The Reds have committed two errors, one of them costly. Fastball for a strike. Charlie's one for two. He singled and scored back in the second. The costly error to which Sean referred by Joe Oliver, a two base error, sending Vince Coleman to third in the fifth inning, and he scored. The fifth Mets run. That's the run that is the difference in the ball game at the moment. Charlie O'Brien, who came in hitting 173, is two for three today, and that's the first hit off Ruskin, the eighth New York hit. Pretty good curveball by Ruskin. So Charlie O'Brien starting one game last night, homered and doubled, and now he has two hits this afternoon. That is the first hit for the Mets since the second inning when they had six of their eight hits. The last hit was the RBI single by Chico Walker in the second. I would imagine Schofield will be bunting here. He is. Ruskin on it quickly, but will go to first. To Morris. It's a sacrifice for Schofield to play 1 3. And now a big runner is in scoring position in a one run game. The Mets on top of the set. Up next, center fielder Vince Coleman. The problem with bunning a runner like Charlie O'Brien to second base is that uh, it could still take two hits to scoring. He's not a fast runner. Ruskin uh, getting the sure out at first base. But Charlie O'Brien, keep in mind, is not fast afoot. 
If you're not a fast runner, you have to take a big lead, a much bigger lead than a, a guy like Vince Coleman would take if he were on second. Vince Coleman's at the plate with a swing and a miss. He's had a good day. He singled to drive in two runs, and he scored in the second. He walked and scored again in the fifth. That was the unearned run. Coleman walked, took third when Oliver tried to pick him off and threw the ball down the right field line, and Coleman scored on a sacrifice fly by Chico Walker. Chopped down to third. It eats up Bip Roberts and goes through into left field. Well, Brian can only move up 90 feet. Don't know if that'll be a hit or an error, but it's an example of another play that the Reds could have made and did not make. They've had a bunch of those this afternoon. Well, this ball just eats Roberts up. The in-between hop off the heel of the glove, caroming into left field. It's funny about baseball. If there were two outs, O'Brien probably scores on that ball, and the Mets have another run. But with one out, you've got to make the ball go through on the left side, and O'Brien ends up at third. It's an error charged to Roberts, the third Cincinnati error of the ball game. Chico Walker is doubled and singled and had a sacrifice fly. Chance for Walker to really have a big day for himself. In the middle of the infield is back at double play depth. If the ball is hit slowly to a middle infielder, they do have the option of coming home again to get the slow footed O'Brien. Ruskin to first. He has opened up a 5-2 lead over Toronto now in the top of the seventh at Sky Dome. Throw to first. Holman back safely. the first Milwaukee run of that seventh inning at Sky Dome and scored the other on an error. That's how it got to be five to two in favor of Milwaukee. The Brewers trying to again climb back under the heels of the Blue Jays. A win this afternoon would quote Milwaukee within three and a half of the front running Jays in the American League East with one game remaining in that series. Tomorrow a day game at Toronto. Bill Wegman against Juan Guzman returning from time on the shelf with the muscle pull. And they pitched out nothing doing two and one the count. I don't understand that pitch out. If Vince Coleman runs he's going to be running to steal the base. It's not going to be part of a hit and run. And Chico Walker's bit, he's the leading hitter on the Mets so why squeeze with him. That didn't make a lot of sense, that pitch out. You put your pitcher in the hole, two balls and one strike. We're in the seventh. The Mets try to build on a 5-4 lead. They have runners at first and third with one out. Vince Coleman is the runner at first, and Charlie O'Brien is at third. The lead has grown to 7 to 2 for Milwaukee and David Cohn has just been removed from his first Toronto start. That's the reason for the smattering of cheers you heard just before the booze for the throw over the first. We just posted the seven runs from Milwaukee on the out of town scoreboard at right center field here at Shea Stadium. Seven walks in his Toronto debut for David Cohn. A lot of people thought Toronto would walk the division title with the acquisition of David Cohn, but Johnny Oates and Phil Garner don't think so. Baltimore, two and a half games back of Toronto, play the Orioles play at Seattle this evening. 
The Orioles of Arthur Rhodes going tonight. They trail by two and a half. Oakland has opened up a six and a half game lead They're in the west of the American League over Minnesota. Twins had to go four and a half hours, 14 innings to beat the Yankees last night. We saw the leads in the National League as well. Pittsburgh two and a half over Montreal. Both the Pirates and Expos lost last night. Charlie O'Brien at third. Vince Coleman at first with one out seventh inning 5 4 New York and a three and two pitch up coming to Chico Walker and with the count full the infield has come in. Coleman is running with the pitch it's a fair ball down the third baseline. O'Brien scores Coleman to third the throw to second out at second is Chico Walker. Mike Cubbage out to argue and he'll be joined by Jeff Torbor. But it's a single for Walker in his third RBI of the game on his third hit and a big run across for the Mets to make it six to four. RBI number two hit number three make that RBI number three hit number three for Chico Walker on the afternoon. Charlie O'Brien had to make sure he scores easily. Vince Coleman stops at third but a fine play by Reggie Sanders a strong throw and it appeared to be a late tag on Walker Ed Montague punching him out. Walker livid as was Jeff Torborg and Mike Covich the third base coach. Now that in second well, that's a big call now there are two outs and that's potentially with a chance for a big inning now it'll take a hit in all likelihood to get that run in from third Ed Montague has had some very close plays at second base this afternoon Jeff Kent with a ground ball to short Larkin stayed down with it and throws him out Kent now 0 for 4 and the Mets settle for just the one run here in the seventh as Chico Walker is now eight for his last 14 after seven the Mets up by two Neil Trainer, please go to the first game Neil Trainer. 6-4 New York as we head to the eighth inning here at Shea Stadium Hal Morris facing the Reds with a three for three day He's driven in three of their four runs the Mets had a big inning in the second against Chris Hammond four runs on six hits and Dwight Gooden They're kind of an up and down start but he's in line for the win if the bullpen can protect the lead Jeff Ennis pitched one perfect inning Trying to do what Gooden could not do, retire Hal Morris, who is lacking only a triple for the cycle this afternoon. Scored two and driven in three. Paul O'Neill to follow, and then Reggie Sanders. Keep in mind the Mets are without the services of John Franco. John Franco will test his ailing elbow next Wednesday. Didn't even talk in the papers here in New York that if it's not uh, if it's not healthy that he will think about hanging it up for the rest of the year. Anthony Young has done remarkably well in his absence. Young has not allowed a run in his last 23 and two thirds innings. That should also quiet the trade talk about John Franco going to the Atlanta Braves. That's been a hot rumor here in New York for days. Morris bidding for his fourth hit. Murray snagged it and in it for the out. We talked about what a disappointing season this has been for the New York Mets, but really the downward slide began in the second Michael half of there, last Paul season. O'Neal. These are the worst records among all Major League Baseball teams since July 22nd of last season, 1991. Since that point, the Mets have been the worst team in baseball. Terrible second half last year. Buddy Harrelson was fired. And then Jeff Torborg, the first year of a four year contract, has uh, suffered at least as bad a fate as Harrelson. Paul O'Neill with a base hit. He's now one for three. The tying run will come to the plate. In the second half of last year, the Mets won only 24 of their last 70 games. That's the first hit off Ennis and the Reds' first base runner in an inning and a third against Jeff Ennis. We're in the eighth, 6 4, New York. Reggie Sanders glad to see Gooden out of the ball game. He was 0 for 3 with two strikeouts against Gooden. Joe Oliver is on deck. Ball one runs inside. Yeah. 
Innes is 30 years old. He's from Decatur, Illinois. Now makes his home in Jupiter, Florida. Base hit. And the tying run is aboard. O'Neill to second on the play. Sanders one for four. And the hits in this game are now even at nine apiece. And Jeff Torbor talks with pitching coach Mel Stottlemyre as they have Anthony Young warming up in their bullpen. And Stottlemyre is on his way to the mound. the Blue Jays pitching staff received a boost in the acquisition of David Cohn although not today with his performance against the Brewers but they got a lift on Sunday night as well for Mel Stottlemyre's son Todd who pitched a one hitter mm -hmm. against the Chicago White Sox took a no hitter into the eighth in that ball game and it's going to take more than Cohn doing well the rest of that Blue Jay starting staff has really struggled this year with the notable exception of Juan Guzman. run at first go ahead run coming to the plate with one out in the eighth the Mets lead six to four Joe Oliver one for three with an RBI double that extended his hitting streak to eight games it was his 18th RBI this month he leads the Reds in August in RBIs Not bad for a guy who started the season five for 51 with runners in scoring position. Five for 51. Mm -hmm. Wow. And he was occasionally the target of some boo birds in mm -hmm. Cincinnati. The one strike pitch from Jeff Innes way outside. One ball and one strike. Bill Doran is on deck. There's Doran, the number eight hitter. <laughs> Lifted to shallow center. And Vince Coleman on to make the catch. Two down, runners still at first and second. Remember, we talked about the breaking ball that Jeff Ennis throws. It stays on the same plane or goes up. See, when you throw a breaking ball from down that from that far down, the ball cannot go down. The sinker can, but you can't, from a uh, from a physics standpoint, you cannot throw a breaking ball that uh, that goes down when your release point is that of a submariner. It's got to either stay on a level plane or go up. Wouldn't that make it easier to hit? Uh, not necessarily. It, uh, because it goes up doesn't mean that it's flat. Mm -hmm. It may have some bite on the end of it. That really is what a slider is. It's a flat breaking ball with bite on the end. Bill Doran up with two outs and two men on. 6-4 New York in the top of the eighth. Ball one outside. The pitcher, Scott Ruskin, is on deck. Doran was hitting 155 in August. That's the lowest batting average in the National League this month. And he's batting 113 with two outs and runners on base. That's second lowest in the league. That's down to first and Murray waves off at us. The Reds strand two in the eighth. After seven and a half, six four, New York. Rolaids relief break standings entering today's action. Dennis Eckersley of Oakland walking away in the American League, and Lee Smith leads Doug Jones in the National League. That is a tighter race. 
Well, earlier this week, Oakland finally lost a game in which Dennis Eckersley pitched. They have been 52 and 0 in games in which Eckersley had appeared for they lost to Boston on Tuesday night. Eckersley gave up the game when he hit the Billy Hatcher. Eddie Murray beginning the eighth against Scott Ruskin, pitching his third inning of relief. One and two the count. Murray's 0 for three today, facing Ruskin for the first time. Ruskin will face the middle third of the order. Murray, Bonilla, and Bass. He's trying to keep it the two-run deficit for Cincinnati. They have batters 9-1 and 2. Do up in the top of the ninth. Pitcher Ruskin scheduled, then Robertson Martinez. Coming up after baseball today on CBS, it's live third-round coverage of the NEC World Series of Golf from the Firestone Country Club in Akron, Ohio, where Craig Stadler, the leader after two rounds, continues to lead, but now he leads by only one over David Peoples. And Fred Couples has picked up a stroke. He's now two back. That's coming up next here on CBS. It was a hard golf course. That's a major league rough out of which mm -hmm. they are hitting. Lose half a club in that rough. The ball fell among Morris and O'Neill and Doran. The ball went in pursuit, but it dropped in foul ground. So Murray is still alive at one and two. David Peoples up challenging the lead. I believe there's a player named Peter Persons mm -hmm. on the PGA Tour. I'm waiting for them to be in a playoff sometime. That would be mm -hmm. fun. Peoples against Persons. Out of play again, one and two. And speaking of grass, we mentioned earlier the condition of this field due to the concert here last weekend. The ground crew here deserves a great deal of credit because a couple of days ago when we saw pictures of the field right after the concert. This field was an absolute mess. The fact that it's playable is a credit to those who take care of it. Including Pete Flynn, the head groundskeeper, and his staff. Almost overran that ball. Ball kind of took a funny hop back to the spot from which he came. Watch how Barry almost overruns it, but he is such a good athlete that the off balance throw is right on the money. Fine play by Barry Larkin. Now Bobby Bonilla batting with one out of the bases empty in the eighth. The Mets lead six to four. In the air, deep left center. Sanders on the run, as is Martinez. To the warning track, they collide, and Martinez held on to the ball. Fortunately, it was not a heavy collision. And Bonilla is out on the long fly to left center. He's now one for four with a double his first time up. I was thinking the same thing. It's, uh, it was more of a cushioned collision. Looked like Sanders slows down right before impact, and fortunately for... Dave Martinez, he was out to drive. Sanders looking at the ball, as was Martinez. When in doubt, give way to the center fielder. Mm -hmm. And Kevin Bass is the batter. He's over three. He's hit into two double plays and is struck out. They're in the top of the eighth now at Toronto. The Brewers still lead the Blue Jays 7-2. We go around the horn in the American League. Wonderful to see Buck Rogers back last night in the California Angels dugout. He returned after missing 89 games. As a result of injury suffered in their bus crash earlier in the season on the way from New York to Baltimore. John Wathen did a commendable job in 
place of Buck Rogers. And of course, Buck had to return and watch his Angels face Roger Clemens last night. They lost to the Rockets seven to one. Larkin throws out Bass. And the Mets go in order in the eighth. We go to the ninth. Last chance for the Reds with the pitcher due up. Then Robertson Martinez at 6 4, New York. 6 4, New York, as we go to the ninth. We'll take this opportunity to remind you that this copyrighted telecast is presented by authority of Major League Baseball and may not be reproduced or retransmitted in any form. Now the express written consent of Major League Baseball, so don't do it. Leading off for the Reds and batting for the pitcher Scott Russell. On to protect 15, a two-run lead before the crowd of 28,687 is Anthony Young. And he's on to face a pinch hitter. Glenn Braggs is batting for the pitcher Ruskin. Young's first pitch, the fastball for a strike. Mentioned the remarkable career of Dennis Eckersley, another remarkable year. A guy who changed from a starter to a closer over his career. Well, here's a guy who did it in one season, two and nine as a starter. Mm -hmm. And he has 10 saves as a short reliever. He has done a remarkable job filling in for John Franco. And as we mentioned earlier, he is not allowed to run in his last. 23 and two thirds innings. A span that encompasses 20 games. And over those 20 games, he has only allowed one hit to a right handed batter. They are one for 36 against him. Wow. Matt Williams, a single, the only hit by a right handed hitter over those 20 games. They don't like Bragg's chances up there off the bench. He's three for 17 this year as a pinch hitter with one pinch home run. 228 overall, seven home runs. And there's a hit. Just the second hit by a right handed hitter in 21 appearances against Anthony Young. And it's a double. The tying run will come to the plate again for Cincinnati. Third baseman, Biff Roberts. That ball hit like a rocket, just fair. May have hit right on the line. On the inside part of the line. The ball was really crushed. And if you take a look at Glenn Braggs and realize when he gets behind the ball, when he hits it hard, he's got something to put behind it. He is built like a linebacker. He certainly is. He's built more like Fort Braggs. <laughs> Roberts is the batter in one strike the count. If one for four today. That's a ball high. That's out of play and left. We mentioned the attendance here today, 28,000 plus. That's a little bit better than the average crowd of 25,000 plus this year at J. And with the poor performance of the New York Mets, the attendance has dropped off a bit here. They are about 400,000 fans behind last year's attendance picks. They watched an entertaining game today, and they're hoping to watch the Mets earn their sixth straight win. Two balls and two strikes. As Dave Martinez on deck. Pardon me, Tim. Excuse me, sir. Uh, as bad as the season has been for the Mets, they do have uh, one glowing thing among their numbers. We'll tell you about it after this pitch. Which is ball three. They are 48 and 0 when taking a lead into the ninth inning. They have not lost a game winning 48 straight times. But uh, Anthony Young in trouble here. Mm -hmm. Danger of walking Roberts and putting the tying run on. Biff sends it to center. Playable for Coleman. Braggs is tagging. The catch is made. Braggs takes third. Center fielder Dave Martinez. 
In addition to Young entering the ball game, Jeff Torborg has Dave Gallagher into the game in right field. Baseball for years has been very conservative in situations like this. A ground ball, when, when you're trailing by two runs, a ground ball back to the pitcher, for instance, a ground ball to the third baseman. If you're on the, if you're the runner on third, break for home. Mm -hmm. Instead of having a an easy play at first base, make the pitcher become involved in a rundown. Martinez on the ground is short. Bragg does break for home, and he scored. But now the Reds are down their final out, still trailing by a run. The run scored by Braggs makes it six to five. Yeah, and that run, uh, for the most part, is meaningless unless it leads to the second run. But baseball for years is saying, hey, you got to be cautious. You're trailing by two runs. Just off See? <laughs> That's out number two, and it's also <laughs> the first run off Anthony Young in 24 in the third inning. And his score of the inning streak comes to an end. That's only when you're trailing, by the way, uh, by two runs. Mm -hmm. You wouldn't try it when you're trailing by one. But uh, if you're trailing by two or more, no sense in allowing a pitcher to make an easy play. Make him make a difficult play. And usually the tag play is more difficult than the four set. Barry Larkin trying to keep the Reds alive against Anthony Young. Young trying to save it for Dwight Gooden. Little looper right field Gallagher on the charge couldn't get it. He got it on a hop. Risky play by Gallagher if that ball gets behind him. And then the tying run moves into scoring position. Late inning defense Gallagher playing understandably deep. And he makes a fine play on the in between hop to hold Larkin to a single. That's a good play right there. He tried for the shoestring catch and failing uh, he did come up with a stop but Larkin now certainly a threat to run and the hottest Reds hitter at the plate. Hal Morris the batter. Swings to the first pitch chopped down to Murray. He ambles over to first. The Mets have won six in a row their longest winning streak since they won ten in a row last season and another tough loss for Lou Pinello with time running out. They need to be taking advantage of a club like the Mets who are way down in the standings but they've dropped the first three games of this four game series. The final score this afternoon the Mets six and the Reds five. We'll be back in just a moment and after we return we'll be sending you to Toronto for a look at the ball game between the Brewers and the Toronto Blue Jays. So stay tuned. There are your totals. The Mets left only three men on base. Cincinnati stranded eight. Dwight Gooden the winner. And Anthony Young saved it. He leads all Major League rookies now with 11 saves. Chris Hammond the loser and Hal Morris had the only home run of the ball game. The offensive star of the game for the Mets was the Chevrolet player of the game, Chico Walker. He had a perfect afternoon. He went three for three with two singles and a double. He also had a sacrifice fly and drove in three runs today. Chico Walker of the New York Mets is our Chevrolet player of the game and Chevrolet will donate one thousand dollars in his name to the Special Olympics. We'll send you to Toronto in just a moment. We're back at Shea Stadium where this afternoon the Mets won their sixth straight made it three in a row over the Reds with a six to five win. Tim admittedly this was a day game after a double header yeah. last night but the Reds didn't play like a team that you would give a high hope for winning the division with the way they played today. Nor like a team uh, that had come into Shea Stadium uh, winners of four in a row and they had cut the lead of the Atlanta Braves down from seven to four games actually to three and a half. But it was a sloppy game today for Cincinnati. Now we're going to